Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this is lesson number five in that series for February 4 of 2023, entitled Dealing with Debt. Boy, I hope we can solve that problem. A lot of people got that one, don't they? <laughs> Okay, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we once again invite your guidance and direction as we study this challenging subject. You know how many people on our world today, even governments, are far in debt. May the guidance that you've given us here be of help to many, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson will provide interesting and challenging, will prove interesting and challenging since dealing with debt is something we usually do not talk about in public. Many consider it a more private matter. Jim? Let's go it up there just a little bit there. From the Bible Study Guide, one definition of debt is living today on what we expect to earn in the future. Today, debt seems to be a way of life, but it should not be the norm for Christians. The Bible discourages debt. In the scriptures, there are at least 26 references to debt, and all are negative. The Bible does not say that it is a sin to borrow money, but it does talk about the often bad consequences of doing so. When, every, excuse me, when considering financial obligations, Paul counseled, Render, therefore, to, to all their due taxes, render, therefore, to all their due taxes. Due to, taxes, to whom taxes are due. To all their due. There's tax, a colon there. Oh, I see. Customs to whom customs. Taxes to whom taxes are due, and custom to whom customs are due. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. One, excuse me, owe no one anything except love one another from the uh, Romans 13 verses 7 and 8 from the New King James Version. And that's from our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon, January 28. Writing to the members in Rome before he reached there, Paul said, Carrie? Romans 13, 7 to 8. Pay then what you owe them. Pay them your personal and property taxes and show respect and honor for them all. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. And that's from the American Bible Society, 1992. Yeah, that's a good news Bible version of the verse he just read up above. Our Bible study guide says, why is debt an almost international scourge at every level? Personal, corporate, government. Every society has always had at least a small percentage who were in debt. But today, a much larger portion of, the, of people are in debt, and it's almost never to their benefit. That's also from our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon. One of the challenges we deal with in these lessons about finances is that almost all of the biblical statements that are used were originally given to the children of Israel. Do these promises and challenges still apply to us as a people? What do you think? I think so, yeah. Even though they were given 4,000 or 3,500 years ago to uh, people who were slaves in Egypt or on their way out of slavery, that, that still applies to us? Well, there's basic principles that are applicable through the generations. I have a, a text I learned years ago, Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. That's coming and up we, here. We, you know, for the, uh, how many years we've been talking how critical, of, uh, how terrible slavery is. Mm -hmm. But what they've done with getting people to go into debt, now you, 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 you're almost glad to be in debt because you you're, uh, buy the new car that, uh, that, and you're, you just lost a bunch of money go, driving it off the lot, and you're happy as, as you climb. So it's all a matter <laughs> of perspective. Well, here's what... Uh, um, Moses said to the children of Israel, one of his final sermons, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2 and verse 12. 
if you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. He will send rain in season from his rich storehouse in the sky and bless all your work so that you will lend to many nations, but you will not have to borrow from many. Now, our, na our nation started out as a Christian nation. I won't say it's a Christian nation now, but it started out as a Christian nation. Was these, these blessings uh, applied in those days? Is that how we got to where we are as a nation? Oh, yeah. Well... Our Bible study guide says studies show that there are three primary reasons that people get into financial difficulty. They are listed here in the order of greatest frequency. Kerry? The first is ignorance. Many people, even the educated, are financially illiterate. They were simply never exposed to the biblical or even secular principles of money management. There is hope, however, this lesson will provide a simple outline of these principles and how to apply them. The second reason for financial difficulties is greed or selfishness. In response to advertising and personal desire, people simply live beyond their means. They aren't willing to live in, drive or wear what they can really afford. Many of these same people also feel that they are just too poor to tithe. As a consequence, they live their lives without God's promised wisdom and blessing. And in brackets it says, see Malachi 3.10, 11, Matthew 6.33. We'll look at those in just a moment. There's hope for these people as well, but it requires a change of heart and a spirit of content. And, uh, Contentment. Contentment. Oh, contentment, yeah, okay. As a Bible study guide for Sunday. Malachi 3, 10 and 11, this is my Good News translation, bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops and your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Is that all we need? Uh, to avoid the insects and have the grapes. And then Matthew 6, and this is, of course, a, a very key part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking to the poor people in Galilee. Matthew 6, 33, Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Okay, does that still apply to us? Can we depend on God for everything? We just, I mean, think about the woman, the, the widow, who paid her two, yeah. two, two mites. mites. Did, yeah. you know, did what? Did, I wish we had the rest of the story. I wonder what happened to her. Yeah. Continuing from the Bible study guide, the third reason people find themselves in financial difficulty is personal misfortune. They may have experienced a serious illness without adequate health insurance. They may have, had, may have been abandoned by a spendthrift marriage partner. A natural disaster may have wiped out their possessions. Or they may have been born and raised in abject poverty. There is hope for these people too. Though their path is more difficult, their troubles can be overcome. Change may come with the support of Christian friends, the counsel and or assistance of godly counselors, hard work coupled with a good education and the blessing and providence of God. Whatever the reason, even if it's a personal's, person's own fault, debt can be alleviated. However, those in debt will need to make some changes in their lives, their spending and their financial priorities from our Bible study guide for Sunday. Moving to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul had some very provocative and challenging words to say about such issues. Jim? 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10. Well, religion does make a person very rich if he is satisfied with what he has. What did we bring into the world? Nothing. What can we take out of the world? Nothing. So then, if we have food and clothes, that should be enough for us. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught up, excuse me, caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires 
which pull them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. What does the Lord prayer it says? Ask, ask for the daily bread. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't you know, see big storehouses of. <laughs> and, uh, Doesn't you don't pray for a palace? No. <laughs> How do you think this advice fits into the wor our world situation at the present time? It seems that material things and wealth are in are an rather incredible allurement. Why is that? Think of all the people who spend a lot of money betting on the lottery. But do we idolize money, making even a religion out of it? Some bad people do. Yeah. What, what is the relationship among our, religi our religious beliefs, our religious practices, and, and our financial issues? Carrie, you want to do that one for me, Matthew yes. 6? Matthew 6, 24. No one can be a slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And that's from the Good News Bible. I John, and what's that? First John 2, 15. Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Again, from the Good News Bible. So why is the love of this world and its monetary benefits so strong? Where does that love come from? Solomon had some interesting comments in that regard. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says, Here's a man who lives alone. He has no son, no brother, yet he is always working, never satisfied with the wealth he has. For whom is he working so hard and denying himself any pleasure? This is useless too, and a miserable way to live. It reminds me of a story I read about a number of years ago. A lady just lived a poor, poor, poor life. She worked hard. She made pretty good money. She was intelligent and so forth like this. And when she died, they discovered that she, would, she had willed $22 million to a school. Well, be thankful for that, but yeah. man alive. In previous lessons, we have seen that God has challenged us to first pay our debts to Him, including particularly the 10% for tithe. David had some comments about that. Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's from the King James Version. Many of us can hardly remember the time when we were baptized as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, if we look back at our baptismal vows, you will discover that you pledged to pay a faithful tithe and to give generous offerings is that pledge still applicable today, many years later? Well, many years ago I saw um, some kind of an official thing. I don't know who did it or, or exactly how authentic it was, but it claimed that only 25% of Advents were paying a faithful tithe. So what would happen if we all paid a faithful tithe? There is, of course, no problem with working hard and make a reason, making a reasonable living. That is not the same as making an idol out of wealth or money. In our day, there are issues with which the ancient Israelites did not have to deal. Jim, you want to try that? In ancient times, families lived together for several generations. The older members were supported by the younger members. That is not often true to, in our day. So how are we to know how much money needs to be saved for retirement? While many governments in, their, in our day provide retirement benefits, in many societies those funds are barely enough to survive on. How does God want us to relate to that issue? Proverbs 22, 7. Poor people are slaves to the rich. Borrow money and you are the lender's slaves. There's your verse, yeah. Jim. Years ago, when I'd advertised that, I said, stop slavery, <laughs> and I put the Proverbs 22, 7 in the ad. <laughs> Do you agree with that premise? Our Bible study guide has a premise with three straightforward steps for getting out of debt. Okay, K, 
Kerry, I guess you to get to teach us how to get out of debt. Okay. The premise is a commitment to God to be faithful in returning his holy tithe to access his wisdom and blessing. He is eager to bless those who obey him. Step one is to declare a moratorium on additional debt, no more credit spending. If you don't borrow money, you can't get into debt. If you don't borrow any more money, you can't get further into debt. <laughs> sort, of, sort of an obvious conclusion, isn't it? Step two is to make a covenant with God that from this point on, as he blesses, you will pay off your debts as quickly as possible. When God blesses you financially, use the money to reduce debt, not to purchase more things. This step is probably the most crucial. When most folks receive unexpected money, they simply spend it. Don't. Instead, apply it to your debt reduction plan. S step three is the hands-on practical part. Make a list of all your debts, from the largest to the smallest in descending order. For most families, the home mortgage is the top of the list and a credit card or personal debt is at the bottom. Begin by making at least the minimum payment due on each of your debts on a monthly basis. Next, double up or increase your payments in any way you can on the debt at the bottom of the list. You'll be happily surprised how quickly you can eliminate the smallest debt. Then use the money that you are paying on the bottom debt to add to the basic payment on the next debt as you work your way up the list. As you eliminate your smaller high interest debts, you'll free up a surprising amount of money in place to the next higher debts. That's quite a, quite a uh, plan anyway. Yeah. God clearly doesn't want us in debt. Once the covenant is made, many families find that God blesses them in unexpected ways and the debt is reduced faster than they had anticipated. By following these three simple steps, many families have become debt free. You can too. By putting God first, you'll receive his wisdom and blessing for managing what he has entrusted you. That from the our adult Sabbath School Bible study for Tuesday, January 31. <clears throat> so what would happen if a large group of Seventh-day Adventists were able to complete this plan and then add to their giving to the church? What, I mean, basically this is a, this is a question we, we need to think about. It's a, it's a challenging one. Yeah. Obviously, you know, I, I think about the fact that couple of, of things that I, I, I learned from, from doing research in the past. And I won't go into all the details, but there was a, a, a gentleman who became, he and his family became Adventists in South Africa. And um, at the time, in fact, before he became an Adventist, he was a very successful merchant. He owned a number of different shops and he owned, owned some huge pieces of property down there in South Africa. A lot of it out in what they call the outback, you would call it in, that in Australia, but big chunks of property that almost nobody lived on, nobody knew much of what was out there. And then he, he started, and I won't go into the details, he started doing some, th some things that were not according to guidance. Ellen White started writing him a letter saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this. And he started losing money, he started losing money, he started selling his property, he started losing, until he was almost bankrupt. And later on he discovered that one of the pieces of property that he had previously owned had the biggest diamond mine in the world. Oh what, imagine if that had still been in the, pro, you know, belonged to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, that would be more than, probably just the high tides from that would be more than the entire income of the Adventist Church. Well, when, when I think of, at home at times, of what that led into, if there was more money put into the church, I think of immediately of uh, there's always people in our community that are hardly got enough money for food. 
and you look at uh, the outfit that's up there in uh, uh, just around from Sacramento that design all the churches and that over in Africa, anywhere that they can mm -hmm. get. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that kind of yeah. money can really get into. Yeah, it would certainly it would certainly make it possible for the church to build a lot of additional um, buildings and so forth and places that uh, <coughs> where where you know money is very short. Yeah. Well, how can we apply the words in Hebrews 11? Uh, he, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13:5 to our lives today. Hebrews 13:5 says, "Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be satisfied with what you have." For God has said, "I will never leave you; I will never abandon you." How's that for a promise? Yeah. There are two traps that God warns us against quite against quite strongly. The first is allowing ourselves to be surety for someone else's debts. Jim, you want to try that one? Proverbs 6, verses 1 to 5. Have you promised to be responsible someone, for someone else's debts, my son? Have you been caught up by other, excuse me, caught up by your own words, words trapped by your own promises? Well then, my son, you are in that man's power, but this is how to get out of it. Hur hurry to him and beg him to release you. Don't let yourself go to sleep or even stop to rest. Get out of the trap like a bird or a deer escaping from a hunter. From the Good, good News Bible. <laughs> That's pretty clear, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, pretty, it's going to be Proverbs uh, 17, verse 18. Only someone with no sense would promise to be responsible for someone else's debts. From the Bible study guide, surety usually occurs when a person with poor credit seeks a loan from a lending institution and does not qualify for the loan. The loan officer will tell the unqualified person that if he or she will get a friend with good credit to co-sign with him or her, then the bank will grant the loan and hold the co-signer responsible in the event of a default from the Bible study guide for February 1. So if you become surety for someone else's debt, be aware the studies show that 75% of those who co-signed end up making the payments. Yeah. Yeah. A second trap Christians should avoid is sometimes called a get-rich-quick scheme. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. Let's look at that for a moment. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires which pull them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. And Proverbs 28, 20, what is the, re warn what is the war warning noted? Um, Carry. Take it. Honest people will lead a full, happy life, but if you are in a hurry to get rich, you are going to be punished. <laughs> That's from the Good News Bible. Get rich schemes are another financial trap. <coughs> they are almost guaranteed to lead to financial ruin for those who get caught up in them. When it sounds too good to be true, it surely is. <laughs> Many people are hurt emotionally and financially. An additional tragedy with these devious plans is that, in many cases, individuals have had to borrow money to become involved in them in the first place. Many lives and families have been ruined by get-rich-quick schemes that end up enriching only the con artists who devise them at the expense of those who fall into their lap. A trap. Oh, a trap. Of these schemes. I've got these uh, green lines running through. Sometimes it gets you. Uh, don't walk, run as fast as you can. That's that old Sabbath school Bible. Yeah, when a friend or even a loved one tries to pull you into one of these schemes, yeah. run, don't walk. Run as fast as you can. Get out. Yes. You know, God gave the ancient Israelites a very special and wonderful plan for avoiding debt. I'm sorry, avoiding poverty and debt. Deuteronomy 15, 1 to 5. 
at the end of every and and think about this. I I I I've tried to imagine what it would be like to to live in a world like this. At the end of every seventh year, you are to cancel the debts of those who owe you money. This is how it is to be done. All who have lent money to a fellow Israelite are to cancel the debt. They must not try to collect the money. The Lord Himself has declared the debt canceled. You may collect what a foreigner owes you, but you must not collect what any of your own people owe you. Does that mean you are more you're you're more willing to loan money to a foreigner? The Lord your God will bless you in the land that He is giving you. Not one of your people will be poor if you obey Him and obey, carefully observe everything I have commanded you today. So, would doing this today encourage some people to try to borrow more and more money with hope that then in a short time all that debt would be canceled? You wonder when you see a thing like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, Exodus 20, 21 2, Jim? If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you for six years. In the seventh year, he is to be set free without having to pay anything from the Good News Bible. Leviticus 25, verses 3 and 4. You shall sow your fields, prune your vineyards, and gather your crops for six years. But the seventh year is to be a year of complete rest for the land, a year dedicated to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards from the Good News Bible. Well, in our day, it is un not uncommon for people to take out loans for 20 or 30 or even 40 years from, for a home purchase. And I'm very happy to say that our 30-year mortgage got paid off about a year ago. Another idea that leads to significant debt is the cost of higher education. While we recognize immediately that owning a home is a wonderful thing and gaining an education will prove beneficial in the long run, both can be expensive. Students who are entering into an expensive form of education should do everything they can to get scholarships or grants. They should plan to work and save as much as they can for school. Often, parents are more than willing to help. In Bible times, as we know, families had assigned plots of land. Parents would give their children a portion of that land to support themselves. And we used to teach that to our people, our friends in Africa, and it makes sense, except you stop and think about it. Okay, if you have a piece of land this big and you got five sons, and you start dividing and each one of them has this big a piece, and they each have five sons, and they, each one of them has a piece, a piece that's about that big. Yeah. Well, on the other hand of the coin, other side of the coin, if you are a lender, are you being fair and honest to those with whom you deal? Do not forget that God is constantly watching you. Carrie? Okay. I'm using Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. It's from the Good News Bible. That's pretty clear, right? Yeah. Ellen White gave a one-page summary of how to avoid debt. You want to go ahead and do that one? Yes. From the writings of Ellen G. White, and as you often see it as EGW, be determined never to incur another debt. Deny yourself a thousand things rather than run in debt. This has been the curse of your life. Getting into debt, avoid it as you would the smallpox. These were, this is a letter obviously written to a particular individual in her day. Yeah. Make a solemn covenant with God that by His blessing you, will pay your debts and then owe no man anything if you live on porridge and bread. <laughs> Could do worse. Do yeah. not falter, be discouraged or turn back. Deny your taste, deny the indulgence of appetite. Save your pence and save your debts. Pay your debts. Yeah, yeah pay your debts, thanks. Work them off as fast as possible. When you can stand forth a free man again, owing no man anything, you will have achieved a great victory. And that was in a letter by Ellen G. White in 1877. How about yeah. that? Our Bible study guide gives some additional suggestions. First of all, establish a budget. Make a simple budget by keeping a record of all your income and expenses or purchases over a period of three months. Many are surprised to learn how much money they spend on unnecessary items. Destroy credit cards. Credit cards are one of the major causes of family indebtedness. They are so easy to use and so hard to pay off. 
If you find that you're, you aren't paying off the cards in total each month, or that you are using them to purchase items that you would not otherwise have bought, you should destroy your credit cards before they destroy you or your mar marriage or both. Begin economic measures. Sometimes we aren't aware of how much we could save on our monthly expenses just by being careful about some of the small things that we purchase. They quickly add up. That's our Bible study guide for Friday, February 3. We are all aware that nations as well as individuals in our day have taken on staggering amounts of debt. And our nation is busy taking on staggering amounts of debt yes. right now. Should church members consider the possibility of helping others less fortunate church members out of their debts? Now that, if we took the advice from Deuteronomy and Numbers and Exodus about, you know, how churches and, and, and groups should work together, we would be doing that. But we don't feel really any, I mean, most of us don't feel any real financial responsibility for other church members. The Bible has some very straightforward things to say about getting out of debt. Jim? Deliverance from debt consists in placing God's kingdom first, freeing oneself from the desire for material things, Matthew 6, In the divine covenant, there is prosperity and an end to debt, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. However, these promises to materialize an experience of love for God is required, which, required, which translates into it obedience to His commandments, to the vows taken during baptism, including the faithfulness to tithes and offerings, Psalms 50, verse 14 and 15, and Malachi 3, 7 to 12 from the Bible Study Guide. So let's look at those verses that the Bible, are, are this lesson is really emphasizing. And let's think about them for a moment. Matthew 6, 33. Instead, be concerned about, and before that, she talks about, don't worry about this, don't worry about your clothes, don't worry about that. I mean, remember this thing about Solomon and all his wealth wasn't dressed as well as the flowers in the field. And then she says, instead, be concerned about everything else with the kingdom of God. How much does that involve? and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Does that mean that if you pay a faithful tithe, you'll never have any financial worries? I mean, how seriously do we take these Bible passages? Yeah. You think that's what Jesus meant when he said that? Well, look at Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. We read that earlier, but... If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. So that's really the background for Matthew 6.33. And then, of course, Psalms 50, verses 14 to 15. Let the giving of thanks be your sacrifice to God and give the Almighty all that you promised. Call to me when trouble comes, I will save you and you will praise me. And I mean, and of course, then the very famous Malachi 3, verses 7 and 12. Carrie, you want to do that one? Yeah. Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. You, like your ancestors before you, have turned away from my laws and have not kept them. Turn back to me and I will turn to you. But you ask, what must we do to turn back to you? I ask you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are cheating me. How, you ask? In the matter of tithes and offerings. The curse is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the rest and you will see that I to will... To the test... Let me do the test. <laughs> Sorry. You will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kind of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops and your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Then the people of all nations will call you happy because your land will be a good place to live in. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, now let's ask a very serious question that we could ask about a lot of biblical passages. 
does this mean that God, if we don't pay our tithe, God says, can't, can't bless you because you're not paying your tithe? But if you do pay your tithe, you give a generous offering, then God says, okay, I'll make sure your vines prosper, I'll make sure your crops are good, da da da. Does God specifically curse, bless, or curse? I mean, it sounds like that in Deuteronomy 28, doesn't it? I, uh, I've seen and heard some of that. Uh, farmers, Adventist farmers, when their wheat crop was ready for harvest and their neighbors all lost theirs with the bushfire, mm -hmm. and they were SDAs, the one that got the... And, uh, oh no, it, it's, uh, God does look after us more than we give him credit for. I worked in East Africa for many years and had a very good friend from Canada who went there to help out to, to teach and, and direct the farm and so forth in one of our schools there. And one year was really dry, quite a bit of drought. And this man knew, understood the raising, of course a big crop there is corn. Uh, what we call corn in this country, they call maize it, they call it maize there. Um, and he knew exactly how long it took for maize to, mat to, ma to, mat to mature and so forth like this. And they, the only workers they had to help them grow crops there were the students. It was just about time for the students to leave for a break. And he says, he went out and he says, it's time for us to, to, dig, and, to dig up and plant. And everybody thought, what? There hasn't been any rains, there hasn't been nothing. He says, we're planting right now. Mm -hmm. There came a rain, a fairly heavy rain, and their, and their corn jumped out of the ground, and there was a long period of uh, dryness. Other people were planting after that, and their plants shot up, and they just dried away. Mm -hmm. But his was big enough to survive. And at the, at the, when the harvest season came, he was the only one around who had um, a good crop. And the school went on. So we're swimming around in a world engulfed in debt. How can we avoid it? Consider these words from Scripture. Jim? Oh no, I guess this is mine. Mark 12, 29. Jesus replied, the important, most important one is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. From the Good News Bible. And then 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what other people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves. Now, how does this fit with other things we've studied about? Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is a true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. I doubt that anyone would question the statement that God wants us to be free of debt. I mean, debt isn't, nobody really wants debt, I don't think. They might want what they, what they can get with the money they can borrow, but they don't like the debt. Obviously, God owns everything. He could resolve all our debts instantly if that was the right thing to do. What God does is to place a solution to such problems in our reach. After all, aren't we managers for the master? That's the name of our series, isn't it? Managing for the master. Consider some principles for becoming debt-free. One, put God first, Matthew 6, 33, we've talked about that. Two, seek help if you need it, Proverbs 15, 12, 22. Three, save, Proverbs 6, 8, and make a budget, Luke 14, 28 to 30. Okay, some more explanations here. Jim? From the Bible study guide, give top priority to God, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. God doesn't want us to be indebted because he loves the prosperity of all his servants, Psalms 35, 27. Therefore, God should always be sought first in 
any debt crisis, Psalms 105, verse 4. The debt could have been a spirit. The debt could have a spiritual origin. And what does that mean? And the debt a, could have a spiritual origin. Well, let's see what it is. See what they say here. Uh, and in such case, one should reflect on the need to confess financial sins such as theft and usury, Ezekiel 18, 12, and 13. Greed, Let's look at that for just a moment. I'm sorry. That was my fault. He cheats the poor. This is talking about people who are doing things that they really shouldn't have been doing. He cheats the poor. He robs. He keeps what a borrower gives him as security. He goes to pagan shrines, worships disgusting idols, and lends money for profit. Will he live? No, he will not. He has done all these disgusting things, and so he will die. He will be to blame for his own death. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, greed, go ahead. Greed, which is idolatry, Exodus 22, 12, and Colossians 3, 5. Unfaithfulness in contracts, Romans 1, 31. Love of money, 1 Timothy 6, 10 and the unfaithfulness in tithes and offerings, Malachi 3, 6 to 10, from the Bible Study Guide. Is it reasonable for us to call on God to help us to get out of debt? Should we be praying to, Lord, help me to get out of this debt that I just got into? I not say anything wrong with it. Oh, I, I, I was just thinking with all the uh, enlargements around here, it's got to be something like that. Call on God regularly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, do you know of any individual who has read these biblical promises and specifically taken advantage of them and been blessed by God? Well, God regards us as special chosen people. There's verses about that in Exodus 19 and 1 Peter. As Seventh-day Adventists, we claim the promise at the end of the Three Angels' messages that, quote, we keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. What did God say about us as a special chosen people? Carrie? Uh, be holy and sanctify holy things. In the Bible, God views his people as holy, chosen, and special. That's Exodus 19.6. This holiness is demonstrated when his people keep his commandments in Deuteronomy 28.9, Exodus 19.6, a people dedicated to me alone and you will serve me as priests. Good now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt for a second now. This is a promise made to the children of Israel. If you read the whole thing, he, he says you're, you're my chosen people, you're dedicated as priests, etc., that was before, just before he spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. And we asked earlier the question, okay, did these promises made to God's people so long ago, to the children of Israel, do they still apply to us? Well, look what Peter said. Okay, go ahead. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light from the Good News Bible. Okay, so if we had gone back and looked at every, the, the, the three verses, the two verses following Exodus 19, we would have seen that Peter here is giving exactly the same promise to Christians as God gave to the Israelites back in, in you know, yeah. the time of the Exodus. Is that sufficient reason to say that these promises still apply to us? It would seem so. It's, it's a hint anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So what should faithful church members do? Let us never forget the following. Again, from our Bible study guide. The tithe also is holy. Leviticus 27, 30 to 32. I'm going to read that for a second. One-tenth of all the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, belongs to the Lord. If a man wishes to buy any of it back, he must pay the standard price plus an additional 20%. One out of every 10 domestic animals belongs to the Lord. When the animals are counted, every 10th one belongs to the Lord. So they, they had to 
run them right past one by one past the past the the priest okay every tenth animal one two three four the tenth one belongs to god and if for some reason um a person decided he wanted to keep one oh you could you could buy it back by by paying an extra amount and the offerings are holy numbers 18 29 give it for the best that you uh give it from the best that you receive that's an offering in these texts, the word holy is kodesh. So the tithe and offerings are kodesh, which means sanctified or set apart for the Lord. To, to withhold the tithe and offerings is to misappropriate sacred things or holy things that have been dedicated exclusively to God and thus must be returned to Him. In the Old Testament scriptures, restitution for withholding was required before atonement with blood could be taken could take place and before the withholder could receive forgiveness and if you remember what did jesus say about if you owe somebody something and you had you're on your way to the temple what are you supposed to do stop and settle your debts with your with whoever it is before you go on to and here it is it's from the old testament um, in the Old Testament scripture, rest issues, I'm sorry, as such when the people withheld tithes and offerings, they separated themselves from God and failed to prosper. For they had profaned holy things. God doesn't change. And this principle of making restitution regarding tithes and offerings, Malachi 3, 6 to 8, is still in force. So the Bible study guide, our general conference, is pretty much convinced that these rules still apply, right? And one thing that you will probably notice by now in these lessons that we have been doing, and that it continues to be even more so, um, this is very clear. It's the it's the general conference saying, and I, I'm not arguing with the fact that they're that they're following scripture. They're using very voice and so forth, but it's very clearly making a an intentional thing to say, we owe our debts to God. Please don't fail to pay your your share to God and of course it might seem a little bit uh, self-serving from the church organization to make sure that everybody pays their tithes and their offerings but uh, I think it's true we should seek help regarding debt we've already looked at that before we look at this if, uh, Proverbs 15 22 get all the advice you can and you will succeed without it you will fail from our Bible study guide again. So this is a counsel from friends and professionals. Sometimes it isn't necessary to acknowledge the condition, of, the condition of indebtedness and to seek help from friends and family. Treatment must be sought in case of debt caused by a psychological disorder. Oniomania, okay, you word experts, what's oniomania? Now you can read it there. An obsessive or uncontrollable urge to buy things. Yes, yeah. Did you ever run across anybody who was like that? No, not quite the same. Yeah. Uh, I've seen people with difficulty trying to sell stuff, and it got them in the psych hospital after a while. It's, uh, Why were they trying to sell? Uh, I think he was in confectionery and stuff like that. And uh, I used to home visit by then. Uh, and I bumped into this guy in a, uh, what would you call it here, a milk bar, I guess. And uh, I asked him how he was doing, and he said, he said, every day is a battle. Every, really? Yeah. Yeah. So if this is the case, it could be helpful to seek spiritual aid from one's pastor, family members, or trusted friends. Asking for friendly support in this process may lighten the burden and encourage the decision to solve the problem. Ask for divine help and wisdom. Divine help may come in the form of discernment. In the Bible, wise management is a gift from God. The wise man declares that, quote, by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, 4, emphasis supplied. Just as the apostle recommends to covet earnestly the best gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and of course, 
What gifts is he talking about in 1 Corinthians 12? He's talking about spiritual gifts. He's talking about prophets and apostles and all those kind of things. But sure, I'm, it probably applies to material things as well. We also can ask God for wisdom to take care of our finances, especially in times of economic hardship. This search for wisdom is recommended by James. James 1, verse 5. That's from our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 67. We in this country have gone many, many, many years without a significant uh, recession, lengthy recession, or, or, or really depression. Yeah. What, would, what would happen in this country if, if we had a real depression? Mm. I just wonder what in the world would happen. Yes. With all the people here and people just barely making it, under the best of circumstances, what would happen if we had a depression? Wow. People are seriously talking about a major recession. Let us consider what inspired counsel said about saving. Proverbs uh, 6, 8. Jim? Well, the Bible said a guide. Be like, the, and, excuse me, Maybe we should idea. go back and read our, our, our passage here. Um, Proverbs 6, 8. You remember what that says? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. sluggard yeah. Consider her ways and be wise. Okay. Go ahead. Be like the ant that in the summer prepares its food for winter. Always set aside some money for your savings. Include in the budget a regular percentage dedicated for this purpose from the Bible study guide. Okay. What would happen if everybody had that? Wow. Clearly, one way to avoid serious financial problems is to have a plan for savings. The clearest example of an enormous savings plan is the story of Joseph in Egypt. What did Joseph do? <laughs> he interpreted the dream, and the dream says there's going to be years of plenty, seven years of plenty, and he stored up so much they couldn't even they didn't even know how to count it anymore. And then, when Egypt was able to feed a large portion of the Middle East, during the famine that by saving up the blessings of grain that God gave, gave it during those seven years of plenty. Okay, so make a budget. Um, I guess that's mine. If one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and work out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation, and all who see what happened will laugh at you. This man began to build but can't finish the job, they will say. Budgeting is an important tool for every family. We should not be surprised at all to learn. Jim? From Ellen White, you ought to be careful that your expenses do not exceed your income. From the Adventist Home, page 375, paragraph four. You almost chuckle at that, you know. Yeah. You be, be careful that your expenses do not exceed your income. Well, of course not. I mean, you know, perfectly good advice, but how often do people ignore that? Yeah. Careful budget should be made following careful thought, carefully thought, careful thought and prayer. Be realistic, plan for some emergencies or unexpected expenses. Do you think that if you put God first in everything, he will give you more than you need so you can share with the more needy? How do you feel about the following quotation? So, if we specifically make a budget and we set aside some for savings and we have money, does that give us, does God bless us so we'll have money to, to give to the poor and the needy and to pay our tithes and our offerings and so forth? Okay. I guess that's Carrie's. Yes, many, very many have not so educated themselves that they can keep their expenditures within the limit of their income. They do not learn to adapt themselves to circumstances and they borrow and borrow again and again and become overwhelmed in debt and consequently they become discouraged and disheartened. That's from the Adventist home, Ellen White. Uh, in the divine covenant, covenant rather, God promised that his people wouldn't be indebted to others. Deuteronomy 28.1 He also established a release 
the release, rather, of the indebted from their creditors every seven years, Deuteronomy 15, 1 to 4. The divine model was not to have poverty in order, not to have debt, Deuteronomy 15, 4. Why was the divine model for Israel in terms of debt not fulfilled, Malachi 3, 6 to 10? And what does Malachi 3, 6 to 10 tell us? In what ways could this be happening to us? Explain how do we avoid this pitfall in our day? Remember how Malachi 3 says, bring your all the tithes and offerings, bring it into my storehouse. If you want, if you want me to bless you, pay, pay what you owe me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, some possible sources of debt. Debt that is beyond our control caused by natural catastrophes, illness, or wars. That's A. B, personal vulnerability, which comes from lack of financial wisdom or experience, ability or instruction. C, complacency as a result of bad habits, boasting, and wastefulness. So which one of these things is the biggest issue in our day? Necessary debt, which may occur because of certain business investments, home ownership, and children's education. Some of these sources of debt probably cannot be avoided, but some can. Which ones belong in each category and which can be justified? So would you like to tell me what you think are the necessary debts? What are necessary debts? Well, certainly home ownership was probably a necessary debt. Children's education is a necessary debt. What other, what other necessary debts can you think of? Well, an ongoing one for food. You've got to make sure you've got adequate clothing. Those probably don't require you to actually go in debt. Sometimes a vehicle, can, you have yes. to go in debt to pay for a vehicle. That, the things that can, we go into debt for in general in our day are, are things that are large, expensive, more expensive things. And then there's a whole lot of things we can go into debt for that we don't really need, right? Yeah. So we encourage you to think about what we've studied in this lesson. There's some good advice um, and make a budget, stay within that budget. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of serving you. Help us to be wise in, the, in managing your funds. We do it for you and, and we know that without you we would have nothing. We wouldn't even be alive. So help us to use our many wisely as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.